like, man, it's so wonderful. You know, it's, it, you know what's cool is singing songs of victory Amen. instead of songs of defeat. Um, you know, praise, the Bible says, stills an enemy. And aren't you thankful that we, we have one that led, led those that were, took, he, the Bible says he led captivity captive. Though, that which once held us, he took, took and, through Jesus, through the blood of Jesus, he what, took and bound them and he led them out. And so if there's anything that is, has, has been holding you, uh, I'll tell you what, praise, I believe, is broke chains today. And so you just, you just put that, those words in your mouth and you just say it so and you'll have it. Amen? Okay. Um, so this morning we're going to wrap up uh, just a two-part or two-week uh, uh, short series, something I, the Lord had laid on my heart to, to teach on. And, uh, and I was trying to get it in real quick it, 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 just because I felt like it was so important. And... Um, and I, so I want you to know this. Last week, you should listen to it again. And then this week, we're gonna, it's not going to be so much of a preach and a Bible study. Granted, I will get a preach on because I'm more of a preacher than a teacher. But, um, but I want you to understand this, that today it's going to be more of a Bible study again, kind of like we did last weekend. And so I'm going to be going through a lot of scriptures, and I see the clock right now. It's 11.08. Um, and I'm going to be mindful of that, but you're going to have to just listen good. And I'm going to also put my notes up on Facebook or a link if you want to uh, go ahead and grab those. You, you, I'm gonna, it won't be up till probably tomorrow because I'm going to do a little bit of editing so you can understand my, my typing. Um, but there's a lot there. So are you guys ready? Oh, yes. All right. Because I'll tell you what, what we're about to look at today, it'll change your life. Yes. I mean, the Word of God always will, but this will change your life. All right, let's just pray. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, and we thank you so much for your word. We thank you that you said it is a lamp unto our feet, and it is a light unto our path. It shows us where we are. It shows us where we're going. Lord, I thank you for your Holy Spirit your, it, to teach us today, and we thank you um, that you just, as we go, that you bring these things to our remembrance. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen, amen. So, you know, the Bible tells us in John, 40, uh, John 6, 44, that no man comes to the Father except for he draws him. How many of you know that that's true? And I, would believe, I believe most of you here, here are here today because you have been drawn by the Father, amen? And that, that's great, but often here's what happens is we get drawn by the Father and we stop short of entering a conversation that he wants to have with you and me. You know, God wants to have a conversation with you and I. And you know what that conversation is? It's the same thing that, we're, again, this is the title is Covenant State of Mind, Part 2. Um, he wants to have a conversation, and that conversation is the same thing that happens when any covenant is cut, is there's a conversation or there's an exchange. And so we're drawn to the Lord, the Bible says. He draws us to Him, but He draws us to Him because He wants a relationship, and He wants to enter, enter a conversation with you and me, and that's a conversation of covenant. Of covenant. 2 Corinthians 3, 6 says this. It says that He has made us to be competent, listen to this, to be competent ministers of a new covenant. 2 Corinthians 3, 6, New Revised Standard Version says, He has made us to be competent. Ministers, not just like, uh, yeah, there's a new thing, and you know, Jesus. You ever heard of Jesus? J E S U S for us? Yeah. No, I mean, he's made us to be competent ministers. He wants you and I to be competent ministers. This is part of the reason he gave us the Holy Spirit. Because we can bring to our remembrance all things that he's spoken to us. Because, you know, when he speaks things to us, yeah, it's not just for our own little hoo hoo diddy and, and goosebumps, but it's because we are carriers of a message. All right, let's keep going. Romans 5, 2 says this. This is the New American Standard Version. Um, uh, it says this, Through him we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace which we stand. It says this in the NIV, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith. It's, I really love that New American Standard Version, though, because it says we have obtained introduction. In other words, when we get saved, what happens is we get saved, it's like, whoa, yeah, we're in. We, get, we gained access. It's kind of like you gain, when you get the ticket, if you get a ticket to the Minnesota Vikings game, which everybody here wants at the brand new stadium, but if you get a ticket to that stadium, you don't just walk in the door and say, I've arrived! And be like, oh, it wasn't that great. Oh, it was so wonderful. No, what do you do? You go, you go find the concession stand. You might first go, what? Find your seat. And, you know, we need to find our seat. Where, where are we seated? 
But I'll tell you what, so often we, God, the Lord draws us and he wants to start a conversation with us and he wants us to be competent ministers because he wants to entrust us. The Bible says the faithful man will abound. So he wants us to be faithful and understand the word because he wants to bring more to us. But he, he wants us also to, to, to gain full access, as it said in NIV, or to, or to have more than just the introduction, more than just walk through the doors or these doors. Amen? All right, and so let's keep going. Galatians 3.11 says this. Um, it says, how, how many of you have ever heard this uh, scripture, that the righteous shall live by faith? The just shall live by faith. Anybody ever heard that scripture? Um, if you look that up, it's actually translated more like this. I was reading some different versions, and then I end up hitting that little, like, B or the little L or the little K. You know, your Bible has those, and you can look at that, and you can look down to the bottom, and you go, oh, look, there's a little commentary. And the little commentary says, it was wrote like this, but originally it was wrote like this. But for your understanding, we wrote it like this. Anybody ever know what I'm talking about? So you have these little commentaries. This one was B, okay? And so the little B said this. It doesn't say that the just shall live by faith. It says this. It says this. It, um, it says, the one who by faith is righteous will live. Not the just shall live by faith, but that faith makes us righteous. Okay, our faith, faith in Jesus, because we're talking about covenant. If faith in Jesus, uh, I'm going to just pause. If faith in Jesus makes us righteous, and that being in right standing with God and faith allows us to live. In other words, this, that the message of Jesus is not about eternity, it's about eternal life. I'm going to say it again. The message of Jesus is not just about eternity. That is literally, that is the introduction. It is about eternal life, the God kind of life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believed in him shall not perish, but have everlasting the God kind of life. Okay? Let me back up and let me just kind of hit a little bit of last week because I might have some pictures of two people. I don't, they're kind of looking like, uh, let me just talk. About, we're talking about covenant, covenant state of mind, and how God has done everything out of covenant. Everything he's done. This whole Bible is, a, is covenant. This is, which would, a covenant is something that was, that was drafted and the Lord cut covenant. He said it was, God, you know, God's covenant was not your or my idea. It was his idea. It was his love that he set upon us. It was his love. He so loved the world. You now, we didn't do anything to deserve it. It was him. And so we're, we're talking covenant, and we looked last week at how God works through covenant and how God worked through covenant with Abraham and how God needed to cut a covenant with someone to get his plan, Jesus, here on the earth. So he chose Abraham. Why did he choose Abraham? The Bible says, because, uh, or we can gather this, that he said that he would command his household after him. And we looked at all these different things, but Abraham needed to believe God. He couldn't just have, it wasn't a one-sided deal. Abraham still had a part to play, and that was by faith. And you'll see that, and I'm going to hit these two pieces of the covenant real quick. Abraham, talking with the Lord, the Lord brought him into this piece of property, or this land, this great land, and the Lord said, hey, this is the land that I brought you to. I led you out of this land of Ur, to this land. I'm going to give it to all, all this to you. After having been there a while, he comes back. And um, the Lord, and he comes back after defeating a great army, and the Lord says, hey, I'm your exceeding great reward, and Abraham was rich and full of cattle and camels and all that good stuff. So he's rich, and, the Lord, and Abraham said to the Lord, that's great that I have all this stuff, God, but who am I going to pass it down to? My servant, Eliezer? I mean, come on. And the Lord said, no, that won't be the one that is going to be your heir. You're going to have a son. And it says this, and Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, right then and there. But at that same time, Abraham was full of doubt or was in question of what God had brought, uh, of the land that God had brought him into, and he said to the Lord, "How? okay, I, I get that I'm going to have a son, I believe you, but how do I know that what you said to me originally, because God wants us to have the full deal, okay? How do I know that I'm going to get this land? And the Bible says that the Lord said, go get the calves, go get the sheep, go do this, slice them down the middle, and cut covenant. And God came down, and the word, or, or a light, a shining, or a ball of fire, a lamp of fire passed between them. God cut covenant, okay, because he could swear by no greater. So there's the, there's the first covenant. And so God's bringing it about, and God's going to bring about this child by faith, okay? All right? And, and, and he's going to walk in this land by faith. 
And after a little while, he's, oh, he's like, I'm confident. I know God, God swore by himself. I know that we're in covenant, and I understand covenant. And our Western culture doesn't under, understand covenant. But here we are. We're going, okay. Um, he, he's like, okay, I know I'm going to have this land. As a matter of fact, I'm already starting to walk in this land and the fullness of this land. But uh, this little baby, being uh, me that I'm like 90-something years old, and my, my, my wife, she's never had a child, number one. And she's the same, you know, well up in age as well. I don't know how this is going to work. Hmm. So what did what it happened? They said, I know how it's going to work. We'll, we'll come up with a way to bring about God's promise. And, um, and so they, they, they said, we're going to do it. And so they got, uh, Sarah said, hey, take my servant or, or, or maiden uh, Hagar. And they had a baby named Ishmael. And uh, the Lord said, um, hey, bud, I need, this is not it. And he said, I want you to walk before me in this land and remember what you said to me. He said, he said walk before me and be thou perfect. Or walk before me and keep your end of the deal. I believe you for a child. And he said, this is how you're going to know. So he said that your children, and you're going to have a son this time next year because that's not your son. God comes and tells him, that's not the one. What you produced on your own, that's not it. What you produced on your own will only produce heartache. And you'll see that that's what Hagar or Ishmael is still doing to this day. And that's, you know, those are those against Israel over in the Middle East. That's the, they're rising against, against them because the things of the flesh are always going to be against the things of the Spirit. We'll see that here in the Word. But, so, you see, so you see that God needed him yet to be in faith yet again. So God came with his Word because God needs him in faith just like he needs you and me in faith in order to see the promise in our lives. So God came with his Word and he said, you're going to have a son this time next year. And when you have it, when he's born, you're going to circumcise him and you're going to say, this is going to be, this is my child. This is how you're going to know. And that day, and he said, and you shall be circumcised, you and your whole household. And that day when he heard what the Lord said, he didn't wait till the baby came and said, okay, well, I'll see what God says when the baby comes. Then we'll see on the eighth day, I'll circumcise that child. No, he said, all right, I heard from God, everybody on the table. And by faith, he entered in again to God's promise. So what we see is God, God brought about through the lineage of Abraham. And you'll see in Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, that it was, it was Abraham, uh, um, which was the father of David, and David, which was the father of Jesus. In, a, in Matthew 1, 1, it doesn't go through all the lineage. It goes Abraham, David, Jesus. Isn't that cool? All right. So we're talking about covenant here. All right. Let's keep going. So... <clears throat> that's the basis uh, of what, what we're talking about. So now, here's what happens. So we know that what the covenant, a covenant that God cut, is something that he had the idea of because he loved us so much. This is why he set, came up with the plan to bring forth Jesus so that the whole world, not just his people that he cut covenant with in Abraham could be saved, but the whole world could, could enter in because God so loved the world. Not just a little bit, so loved the world. And so we, we, we got saved. A lot of us are saved here. And so this is why this is so important for us to understand this, okay? Because we are to be competent ministers of this covenant, okay? But so we get saved, and we get saved by what? Because we were good? No. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. It's, it's by God's grace. Grace, I, I wrote this, uh, you've probably maybe even heard this acronym before, but grace. Grace is simply this. Grace is God's riches at Christ's expense, Right? That's so it was by God, God's riches at Christ's expense. It was by grace that we've been saved, but it's through faith. It's through faith. So we get saved through faith. And here's this is why um, this is so important. What we're talking about is because we got saved by, it was by grace, but through faith. But then what happens as the church is very often we stop living by faith and we start going back to our performance. Now, stick with me as we cruise through some scriptures, all right? Galatians chapter 3, we're going to go with the whole thing. Oh, foolish Galatians, or, or church, okay? That's the okay? church of Galatia. Um, who has bewitched you? Who has fooled you? It was before, and I'm going to read uh, this out of the ESV, and I'm going to read it, and I'm also going to throw some nadies in it, all right? 
Okay, so Christianese, whatever, Nadies, whatever. I'm just saying it's not gonna. I'm not gonna read it all verbatim because it'll take a little bit too long. That's why you have the notes and you just follow along. It says, "Who who has who has it fooled you? It was before your eyes that Jesus came uh, publicly portrayed as and crucified. Let me ask you only this: Did you receive the Spirit or by works of the law or by hearing of faith? How, when Jesus came and you received the Spirit of God on the inside of you, was it by what you did or was it by faith? And and are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit? Are you now being perfected by the flesh? In other words, he's saying you once be, you got saved by, by, by faith and by believing, and now you're trying to work out your salvation and, and, and stay in a place of righteousness by what you do. You're trying to keep yourself in a state that you couldn't get yourself in the, in, in the first place. What's wrong with you? Who's fooled you? Did you suffer so many things in vain? If indeed it was in vain, does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the law, or is it by hearing uh, with faith? In other words, the miracles that are being done and going, all these things that are happening, when Jesus went about, when, when the, the book of Acts is being written during this time, and, and Peter, and they're walking, and the shadows are, being, are healing people, and all this kind of stuff, just amazing stuff. He's it wasn't, A.K. you got to make sure you do this, 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 and this, and this, and then you'll be healed. No, he said it was by faith. They heard the word, and they said, yeah, and they were healed, okay? Um, just as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted for him righteousness, verse 6. He says, it was by faith, just as Abraham he believed God, and it was counted him to righteousness. But th- know then that it is those of faith who are sons of Abraham. So, um, how do you become a son of Abraham? When you get born again, you, what happens is, the Bible talks a lot about this in the New Testament. When you get born again, it takes us back to Abraham, before the law. It takes us back to the covenant before there was a new covenant. It takes us, the, our covenant of faith in Christ takes us back to the covenant of faith of Abraham. Okay? All right, so, he, so it tells us that it's through faith we are sons of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing uh, that God would justify the Gentiles by faith preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham. Isn't that interesting? The gospel was preached to Abraham. That there's going to be one. I'm going to bring it through you. It's going to be, you know, God, it doesn't say everything that God said to Abraham, but we know that God showed up to Abraham multiple times and having straight to face-to-face conversations. All right? Um, saying, in, in, uh, in you shall all the nations be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. I'm going to jump down to verse 14. Uh, I'm going to read through 10. It says, For all who rely on works of the law are, are under a curse. All those who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things. In other words, the law, if you go read in, uh, in Exodus chapter 20 through the 32, there's all these laws that are written, right? There's just laws and laws and laws and laws and laws and laws and laws. And these laws were written, and this is helpful. I'm telling you a little bit of story because you can kind of maybe go back and look and say, okay, wow. But Jesus, or the Lord said, I'm going to come down to the Mount Sinai, which is where Moses was originally talked to in the burning bush. And now here he's bringing the children of Israel out of Egypt, and he's going to bring them to the mountain, the mountain of God. And so this mountain of God, he, the Lord tells him, come in three days, I'm going to come down on this mountain, and I'm going to talk with my people. And so uh, he says, nobody can touch the mountain, nobody can come on the mountain, not an animal, not a person. If they do, they'll die, okay? And so he comes, Moses comes down and tells the people, God's coming down, he wants to talk with you. This is so awesome. And so three days later, the, Moses ascends, and the Lord comes down with fire and smoke and lightnings and thunders and just great glory and just uh, awe, right? And so much so that the Bible says that the people became to be afraid, and they said, I don't want to hear. you got to go read this for yourself. I don't want to hear what God has to say. You just tell me, and I'll do it. And this is where we are at. We get saved. The Lord draws us to him. We get, we get taken out of our uh, Egypt of bondage of slavery, okay? We're, we're once, and now we're like, oh, yay, we're saved. We're going to heaven. And we don't ever enter a conversation with him. We, we, we just stop. And what happens is, is, is everything that we begin to do in our life is we try to do what God says, and we can never do enough right things. As a matter of fact, the outside cannot 
control the inside. It's the inside that's to control the outside. But God's con- the conversation that God talks with us and He brings us His Word, that's what changes our heart on the inside so that the things that we're wanting to do on the outside can come about. Because everyone in here could say, I don't want to do certain things, but I still fail to do them. Everyone in here could say, there's certain things in certain areas of my life that, are, that can be a struggle or can be a stronghold. And God says, I don't want that to be so. I want to, to change you from the inside out. I want, I want you to look more and more and more and more like me. But what happens so often is we just try, and we try to change the outside with the outside effort instead of letting the inside become what's on the outside. It goes on to say this, um, but it says, All who rely on the works of the law, they're under a curse, for it is written, Curses everyone who does not abide by all things. In other words, the law is so great, there's so many things, there's no way in the world you could keep it. Okay, and if you break it, you're under a curse. You're not blessed, you're under a curse. Okay, now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. It doesn't say the righteous shall live by the law. The righteous shall live by believing in Jesus. So by believing in Jesus, you're made righteous, not by doing good things. Okay, but the law is, is not of faith. Rather, the one who, who does them shall live by them. So in other words, this, if you're gonna, if you're gonna live by the law, you're gonna be judged by the law. Okay? Christ redeemed us, the Bible says in Galatians 3.13, from the curse of the law. Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, so that Christ Jesus, so that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promise or the spirit of the Spirit through faith. How do we receive the promise? Anybody, how do we receive the promise? It's by faith. Do we, do we receive the, the promise of Jesus and eternal life, okay, God, God kind of life, by works and the law and doing enough good deeds? No, it's by faith, okay, by faith. So to give a human example, even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it's been ratified. Now the promises were made to Abraham and his offspring, singular. It does not say offsprings. Referring to many, but referring to one. And to, you, and to your offspring, who is Christ. So he says this promise was made to Abraham and his offspring. And you see, it wasn't to all the, the children, but it was to his offspring, which he was going to bring through the line of Abraham, a child. And that child was going to be given birth by a virgin, and her name was Mary, and his name was Jesus. And this is where you see in Matthew chapter 1, and the, it was the father Abraham, father of David, David, father of Jesus. Okay, can you see this? Are we following? All right, let's keep it going. Verse 17. This is what it means then, the law, which came 400, uh, 430 years afterwards. The law did not come at the time of the covenant was cut with Abraham. The law or the Ten Commandments, which in addition to that was a whole list of other laws, way, way larger than the, than the Ten Commandments. And we have trouble with ten. But uh, they have said so many. 430 years afterwards, he says that this does not annul the covenant that was previously ratified or cut by God through blood by God. So as to make the promise void. For it... Um, uh, for if the inheritance comes by the law, it is no longer comes by promise. But God gave it to Abraham by promise. So here's what he's saying. There was, there was a law that was given, but the, the covenant was cut first. Why was the law given? Oh, the law was given to curb sin. But, you know, you're left to wonder, wonder how God would have worked it had the children of Israel come to the mountain instead of saying, you know, I don't want to enter conversation with you, God. Instead of saying that, and going away and say, Moses, just tell us what he says. Oh, Moses has been a while. Let's build a, a, a calf because uh, we need someone to lead us through the wilderness. Yeah. Yeah. This is what happened while Moses was gone. Well, what if the children of Israel didn't walk away and say, Oh, Mo- Moses, just tell us what God says. I don't really want to hear from God. What if they would have stayed there and said, and listened, and, 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 and Moses told them, Do not be afraid because the Lord wants you to see and, and be full of of fear and awe, reverential fear and awe, like a, like a just, oh, that's the Lord. He wanted to enter, well, I don't know. Maybe the law wouldn't, wouldn't have been given to that extent, but they just said, uh, just tell us what to do. I, I don't know. It's interesting. Interesting thought. All right. 
So let's keep on going here. So um, 430 years for as long as... So why then the law? It was added because of transgressions until the offspring, uh, to the offspring singular, could come to whom the promise had been made. And it was put in place through angels by the... Uh, we cut, we, you know, between the Lord. He said, hey, this is what we're going to tell them to do. Verse 21, is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. For if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. So here's what it's saying. So did the law, was it going to be able to make righteous? No. The law can never make righteous. Okay? This is what this is saying. Let's go on to verse 23. Um, Now, before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So here's what happened. We, We used to be held prison by, you know what we were held prison by? The law. And actually... A lot of the church is still held prison by the law. It says, before faith came. How, did, how does faith come? By hearing, hearing what? The word. And it says in John 1, and now the word, in the beginning was the word, in the word, verse 9, I think it is, and the word became flesh, which is Jesus. Okay? So when Jesus came, faith came. Okay? Um, so then, or, you know, it arrived. So then, the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now, faith has come, and we are no longer under that guardian. In other words, one translation says it like this, a babysitter. The law was our babysitter. Like, in other words, there wasn't a father at the house. The father couldn't be with the child. So there was a law put because sin so there was this guardian, this law, there's a babysitter that said, don't do this, don't touch that, don't touch that. It says, but, but guess what? The law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we're no longer, the babysitter's gone home. And it says this, for in Christ Jesus, we're sons. The Father has arrived. The Father came, now that, so here's what the deal. Now that we're in Christ, the Father's home. The Father, I love, I love the, 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 just the idea of that, that the Father's home. You know, how many of you know that you can ask the babysitter things? You can, the babysitter, just, it's just not mom and dad, okay? Um, since we've got through faith. For as many of you who are baptized in Christ have put on Christ, therefore uh, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male or female, you are all one in Christ. So if you've been saved or if you've been believing in your heart and confessing with your mouth Jesus and the Lord, the Bible says you're saved. What happens is you're baptized, death, burial, and resurrection. That's a picture of in water, but this is what happens in Christ. And now you are no longer of yourself. You are a new creature in Christ Jesus, and you are now in Christ Jesus. Okay? So now you're not, there's not male or female, there's not Greek and Jew, there's not, it's, it's in Christ. You're in Christ. So, um, and if you are in Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring. And if you're Abraham's offspring, guess what? You're heirs according to the promise. And if you want to look at the promises that, that, that Christ gives you, you go to Deuteronomy chapter 28. And you go read 1 through 14, you see the promises. But then you go read, keep on reading, and you can read the curse. And you can see that anything in the curse you're also redeemed from. So there's things you're redeemed to, but there's things you're redeemed from. And I'll tell you what, you, 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 this is kind of like that first thing. God drew, no one comes to the Father but, except for he draws them. And we should go enter that conversation. What conversation is that? The covenant conversation. You can't ever enter a covenant conversation if you don't even know what the, the promises are. So the promise and, 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 what, and the curses, the Okay, what you're redeemed from and what you're redeemed to. Deuteronomy chapter 28, go check it out. All right, now, Genesis 21, 1 through 13, Young's Living Translation. It says, and Jehovah looked after Sarah, and I love this, I love this piece, okay? Here we are back in Genesis, okay? So we see what God had done, and it was, it was not of the law, okay, which is the, which is the old covenant, okay? Not the covenant with Abraham, which is a faith, but the old covenant, which God, the people said, we'll do our part, you just do your part, God, and they couldn't do their part, okay? Now, here's this, this, the picture of that. And Jehovah looked after Sarah, and he had said, um, and Jehovah doth to Sarah as he has spoken. So Sarah, here's what happened. Sarah conceived a son in old age, and she bore Isaac, and Abraham circumcised Isaac on the eighth day, verse 5 of 21. And Abraham is the son of 100 years, and Isaac is the son being born. And Sarah came, let me, just, let me just cruise through this. Sarah gives birth to Isaac, which is a promise. 
And while after Sarah gives birth and he becomes of age of being weaned, what happens is, is they throw a great big party. And during this great big party, the other child, which was not from Sarah, which, was, which is of promise, but the other child, which is Ishmael, which is of Hagar, which is, was done by the flesh, is now making fun of Isaac. This is what's happening. So there's this great, there's this great party, uh, um, and Sarah seeing the son Hagar, uh, the son of Hagar the Egyptian, whom she has bore to Abraham, mocking. She says to Abraham, cast out this handmaiden and her son. For the son of this handmaiden has no possession with my son, Isaac. So he has no inheritance. The, the one that was by, the, the, there's no promise for the one that's by the flesh. The law, okay, the, there's no promise for the one that's by the flesh, but the one that is by promise, which is Isaac. And the thing, it says, and the thing is very wrong in the eyes of Abraham for his son's sake. So here's the deal. Here comes Sarah. Throw out, get rid of Ishmael. He's like, wait a minute, that's my boy. Because, you know, as a father, that's your kid. I don't care if I'm married to a new girl or whatever. I mean, I mean he took Hagar as a wife. But, and she's now Sarah saying, now, kick, kick out this person? No, I'm not kicking out my boy. That seems wrong. What are, you, what are you talking about, Sarah? And listen to this. And God said to Abraham, let it not be wrong in your own eyes because that he is your child and because of the handmaiden. All that Sarah says to do unto her, listen to her voice. Whoa. Wait a minute, wait a minute. God is telling Abraham now, what? What is he telling him? Listen, listen to what Sarah said. Kick him out. Yeah, but, it, yeah, but that's, that's not the way I think. Let me tell you, get rid of the old. Amen. When you get born again, it goes on to talk about here how this is a, a picture of the covenants. When you get the promise, which is Jesus, once you've received the promise, you kick to the road the old. Yeah, but no, but don't you know, don't you know, don't you know, don't you know? Listen, do as Sarah said. The Lord came to Abraham and said, we're not leaving this around. Let me keep on reading here. Um, he says, hearken to her voice, for in Isaac is a seed. Listen, a seed, okay? How many of you know a seed, singular, that there's a seed? What was in Isaac? It's Jesus, Okay? Called, he's called to you, and as the son of the handmaiden, also for a nation, is in him, too. So there's a nation in that seed, in, of the seed of the promise, which is Jesus. But in your seed, Abraham, there's also a nation, and it's your seed. So the works of the flesh, guess what the works of the flesh are going to produce? More works of the flesh. And the works of the flesh are going to be contrary, it goes on to see, say, uh, against the things of the Spirit. Okay, Galatians uh, 4, 21 through 24 and 28 through 30. Tell me, you who are willing to be under the law, the law, the, the law that you hear, for it has been written that Abraham had two sons, one by a maidservant, one by a free woman. But he who is of the maidservant, according to the flesh, has been, and he who is of the free woman, according to the promise, which these things are allegorized, for these are the two covenants. We, brethren, as Isaac, are children of promise, but as then he who was born according to the flesh did persecute him according to the Spirit also now. So here's what's saying. Hey, we got born again by promise, by one of the seed of Isaac, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Jesus. And so we're born of promise. But Hagar had a child of Ishmael, and that would be of the flesh. And it says still to this day, the things of the natural man war against the things of the Spirit. Here's the deal. As the church, right now where you sit, there's a war going on. And it's the war between what you think and what God said. This is the war that was with Hagar and Sarah. Sarah had a word, what God said. Well, what was the, what was the war going on? Well, I don't see how God can make it happen, so you know what? I'm going to go with what I think. And this is still happening today. After you receive Jesus and you've been made righteousness and sin has been defeated and it no longer holds you because we don't see clearly and we're going to keep on going. You're going to, this is where I think it's really going to get good. We, we don't know how to live. We, we, we live with both in the household and there's just junk. And there's no, you can't even inherit the blessing and the promise. And it, it, can you, everything gets all mixed up. Think about this. In this household, you, you have all the families of different families. And now in that household, the tree isn't splitting anymore. You know, it just, it's like all getting mixed. 
You got law and you got promise. And, it, and if you don't kick them out, you're, 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 the way you think is jacked up, messed up. Because we don't know what this says. All we have heard is the traditions of men. And, and the Bible says, and the traditions of men can make the word of God to no effect. Okay, let's keep going. The Old Testament was legalistic and based upon our performance. The New Testament, on the other hand, is a covenant of grace based upon what G, us accepting what Jesus did. Okay, Old Testament performance, New Testament, Jesus accomplished. Okay, yet today, here's what happens. We, we, we often, a lot of us live in the old covenant, okay? All right, average Christians have been taught and believe that the sins that they commit before they were born again were all forgiven. When you get born again, the sins are forgiven, okay? That's, that's what most of us average Christians would believe this, all right? But they believe that the sins that they commit after their salvation all have to come under the blood and be confessed one by one. Now listen. Stick with me. Keep your eyes and ears open. This is what we believe. Okay, everything that I did up to that point when I received Jesus, whoo, good. Skeleton can be out of the closet. It's washed away. Thank you, Lord. But anything that I do after this, it's got to be confessed one by one. This is what we, it's like, okay, uh, where are we getting this? The extreme legalistic believers believe this, that Christian, uh, if a Christian does not confess their sins, they'll go straight to hell. So, like, if the rapture comes and you just were doing something or did something or talked bad back to your wife or whatever you did, and the rapture comes, those clothes that are laying in this really nice little neat pile, well, they didn't go up. They went down. Okay, you went down. I mean, this is, isn't that a scary thought? How, long, how can you sing, we're no longer a slave to fear? You can't. What, what's the, what's the, the thing about being saved? Wait, it's, there's, there is none because you're back under the law. You got to do, you got to do, you got to do, you got to do, you got to do. Now stick, stick with me because we're going to bring this whole covenant together. All right. But then there's also some um, less extreme believe that at the very least the person will lose their fellowship. Listen to me. They believe that if you sin, you'll lose your fellowship with the Lord. Because God can't have fellowship with sin. So this has been taught. So you lose your fellowship with the Lord if you, if you miss it. You mean that, that means he can't talk with you. You know, because you know when we have fellowship, there's like an exchange, right? You know what that means? Let me just, if, that, if that's true, you can't come to the throne of grace. You can't come boldly and you can't come to the throne of grace, which is what you need. Because it's not, uh, it's not of works, but it's by grace. So once you mess up, dude, you're, you're just fresh out of luck. That's what that's saying. And this is where a lot, of, a lot of believers, after you mess up, and there's some maybe even here today, that you messed up. And you, your heart is to do right, but you messed up. And you messed up enough times in the, in the voice of condemnation got in there long enough to where now you say, I'm, 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 I've walked away from the Lord. I've walked away. In other words, you haven't had conversation with Him when, when in just in a moment you could have a conversation with Him. And so we have this, this line of being backslidden or, or whatever because of, uh, it's, it's, it's a doctrine that's been taught that you literally go, you're, you go wayward and that, that you can't enter in and you can't come back to the Lord unless you come to church and you come to the altar and there's a crying session or something like that. And so what happens is, is you literally, not you, but, yet, but it is you, you take the word of the works, or which is the voice of Reason, which is the voice of whatever you think, which is simply Satan's doctrine. And you take it and it cuts you off from the promise. It doesn't cut you off from fellowship. It cuts you from the promise. And this is where we're all messed up. We say, oh, you know, we're gonna, if, you're mess, if, you're sin, if you're sinning, Jesus comes back and you didn't confess your sin, then you're going to hell. Okay, well, maybe not. Maybe, you know, but you better at least confess your sin because if you're not confessing your sin at the very moment, then guess what? Your fellowship's broken. Then guess what? You can't hear from God. No, 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 no. Wrong, wrong, or wrong, or wrong. Or the word doesn't say that. But what does happen is what sin will cut you off from the promise if it can lie to you and tell you that you're out now out of fellowship. Because the promise is by faith. Remember we read this? So we spent all this time, I know it seemed long, and like, okay, what is he reading? The promise was by faith. So what do you need 
to have faith. You need to hear God's voice. So this is why condemnation comes in and says you can't talk. So this is, this is all in the church. We're not talking about the world here. I'm talking about the church. All right. Uh, how many know if you've made Jesus your Lord, <laughs> you've become a new creature? Guess what? Sin is no longer, listen to me, sin is no longer an issue between you and God. Now I'm going to give you some scripture to back this up because you're like, okay, this is really extreme grace. No, this is extreme gospel. You know what that means? All gospel, no Nate. All gospel, no, 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 no. Uh, well, none of that. Hebrews 10.10 10 says this. For by which, you, uh, by which will, <clears throat> will be sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. If you have your pen or your highlighter and you have a Bible, you better underline that, highlight that. Guess what? By which we, were, we are all, we are sanctified, excuse me, we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Once for all. One time. For all. Okay? You read it, and you, okay, read it. Verse 14 says, For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Forever, Sandlot. Forever. Somebody needs to underline that. Forever. Not today, as long as you're good and you're in church. Forever. Sin's been settled. Sin has been settled. Sin has been settled. This is why we can sing, and this is why we sing songs of victory, not, oh, well, I hope, I hope, I hope. No. It's been done according to the Word. Jesus paid the price for all sin, and there's nothing left to pay. There's no other way to say it. Okay? All is for, uh, forgiven forever, according to Hebrews 10.10 10 and, and Hebrews 10.14. Once you understand this, it gives you confidence to guess what? Enter boldly. Amen. Why do I need to enter boldly? So I can get what I need. Does it, the, so now that sin has been forgiven, does that mean you don't need to come to the throne? Hey, hey, I get to go to heaven. Why in the heck am I in church? Let's just go get a sea do and get a blow pop and, you know, go wild, right? <laughs> Every weekend. What? I don't know. What are we going to Why? Why even be in church? Why even come and learn? Because sin's been dealt with. Woo! Yeah. Let's just do whatever we want. Let's keep reading. All is forgiven forever. Once you understand this, it gives you confidence to come boldly to his throne and get what you need. Why do I want to come boldly to the throne of grace as it says in Hebrews 4.16? Or four, four, yeah, I think four sixteen. He um, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain something. What mercy, which is not getting what we deserve. Okay, and 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 find grace to help in time of need. Well, because as long as we're in this world, seed time and harvest remains. Eternity's been dealt with, but eternal life and the promise that you and I have. This is what, what, why we need to come, because I don't want to be sowing seeds that are, are a bunch of junk, and I'm reaping the harvest in my life, and my children, and all. I'm reaping the harvest. Eternity's dealt with. You go to heaven, your name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life. But how you live, because the gospel is not about eternity, it's about eternal life. So why do I want to know what the Word of God says? Well, because the Word of God is God's grace or His empowerment to you and I to be able to do what we want to do so we don't have to reap the wrong benefits. Amen. I don't want to reap the wrong things. Because the Bible says, Be not deceived. God is not mocked. What a man sows, he will reap. As long as heaven and earth remain, seed time and harvest, as long, as long, basically, as long as there's heaven and earth, seed time and harvest will remain. In other words, what you sow, you're going to reap. Thank God for his mercy. You better want to run to that place. Because even while you're on this earth, God's mercy. You know, we serve a God that, that, that's, that's just. In other words, that means this. If you did it, you're going to pay the piper. Okay, listen. But we serve a God that's just, that's full of mercy. Well, okay. So I want to come and I want to get the mercy. But yet, his greatest attribute is that he, lo that he loves to do is extend grace. Think about this. We serve a God that's just, who's full of mercy, but delights the most in extending grace. 
God's grace is his power for you and I. So when we come, we come to the throne. Well, what, I, I, here's the deal. If I come to the throne of grace, I can, I can obtain mercy, which is not getting what I deserve. I mean, literally, take the seed out of the ground. Well, you did it. Now you're reaping it. And there's no way too bad you did it. You did it. You did it. And see, Tom, the harvest, you're going to pay hell. You got hell to pay. You've been sowing hell seed. You got hell to pay. Man, I wouldn't want to be you. Yeah, but nothing's really happened yet, and this has been going on, and, and yeah, I missed it, and this and this, and oh, dear God, I don't even know what I'm going to do. You know, you just see people just all messed up because of crazy doctrine, because of not the word of God being heard, because we enter in and we go, oh, we've arrived, and somebody starts talking and go, oh, that's the game? Well, that's what I came for? No. I want to come to the throne of grace to obtain that mercy. It keeps me coming because I know how good God is. But I also know that he wants, never, never once can the outside change the outside. It's the inside that changes the outside. All right. Um, so, you know, many times we pray this prayer that David prayed back under Old Covenant. Oh, and you remember when David messed with Bathsheba? Okay. And now here's the prophet. Nathan comes there and says what? Hey, you messed up. He gives him this parable and says, who's that? And David said, that guy should be killed. And he said, that guy's you. You're that man. And so here's what David prays. Creating me a clean heart, O God, renew a right spirit in me. Cast not away from me your presence. Take not your spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of my salvation and uphold me with the free spirit. We shouldn't be praying that. That's not our covenant. He's not taking his spirit from you. What do you mean restore unto me the joy of your salvation? The joy of your salvation was nothing that you, 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 you believe God. and it, it, why, Where did the joy go? You, it, it, it's still there. Your salvation hasn't ended. But we're praying Old Testament things when we've been, we're now in this, this covenant that's of faith to receive the promise. All right. Uh, uh, here's what happens, you know, so we, we pray this. How many of you know in Ephesians 1.13 it says that you were sealed with a promise, the Holy Spirit. Think about, the, think about an old letter, and you take a piece of wax, and you melt it on there, and you put an insignia on it. It's sealed. You know what that means? And you know who can open that seal? Go look in Revelations. Who can open? And one became that could open the seal, open the roll. The, not just anybody can open the seals. Of the rolls and the letters, you go look, and then you'll see that it, there's one that can come and open it, and it's no one else. It's not you. Well, I fell from grace. I can fall. You can't just fall from grace. When you're sealed, you're sealed. You gotta, you gotta see what the word says. And this is what I believe. But it's by faith, or it's by grace that you're saved through faith. You gotta ask yourself, what do you believe? It says. Uh, he, he tells us that he promised he would never leave us, Hebrews 13, 5. Uh, it tells us that um, his, his love, joy, and peace are now permanent parts of our spirit, Galatians 5, 22. And the fruits of the spirit are what? This is what the, these are, your, your joy is not going anywhere. Restore to me your joy. It's permanent, Galatians 5, 22. Um, but this is what happens. There's still, there's still Christians today that believe that our relationship with the Lord is dependent upon what we did or didn't do. You know, um, and this is where I said, uh, this is Mark 7. It, said, it tells us this, that we make the word of God, Mark seven thirteen, to none effect. Wait, how could you make the word of God to none effect when the word of God is alive and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword? But you can make it to no effect. Yeah. You know how? By saying, to taking yourself out of faith in that promise of, what, of Jesus and putting yourself back under the law of performance. So now, the promises of God that, he, that are, are written in here, this is the terms of the contract. How many of you got hit by hail this year, and you had to go look in your, hey, what's my deductible? Oh, I wonder if that's covered. Oh, hey, look at there. Hey, oh, hey, that, that's on there too. Hey, oh, my, my, my shed out back. Oh, hey, look, air conditioner unit. Oh, hey, look. Oh, hey, my tree. I, got, I even get a $1,000 for a tree. Yeah, that one kind of got a broken branch in the front yard. Oh, you, you, what you're doing is you're, you're, you go through that contract, and, and I heard Kenneth Copeland, he was talking about the contract. You find out what's in that insurance contract. But for some, you know, because you're going to get paid. It, but that's with a, a man. This is a covenant cut with the Lord. So what's in my contract? 
My contract, I got, by his stripes, I was healed. The, the chest say, peace, peace that passes understanding. That's mine. But it can be no effect if I take and put myself where? Back under the works. We can't have that. Why? Because you and I are to be ministers of salvation. Competent. That means you not only know your stuff, but because you know it, you show it. The Bible tells us that we're to shine like stars in this generation. In Philippians 2.13, I believe it is, it tells us that, that we are to shine like stars. That we're to, not like a firework, you know. Because baby, you're a firework. <laughs> All right. What defiles a man? It comes from the inside, not the outside. This is why the Bible says in Romans 12, 2, 1 and 2, it says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Change, transform, it speaks of being inside out. Conformity speaks of outside in. God wants you and I, and I, we're playing whatever. We're, we haven't even started communion. But here's the deal. We're going to do communion here in a minute. Sorry. I'm just me, you know. I'm not trying to, that's our, thanks, I appreciate it. Hey, are you going to play that music that you, yeah. Just, you got to sometimes try to keep up with this. I struggle with that. Thank you, Lord. Here's the deal. I could, I, I'm going to post these notes. You know, you've heard the story about the prodigal son, right? Prodigal son, there's a story. The dad has two sons. One son stays in the home and does everything for his father. Other son takes his inheritance and goes and squanders it away. Both sons, listen to me, neither of them understood covenant. The father did, but neither of them did. One thought, it, what you see, it's, you see, it was two ditches. It was this, got to do, you got to do, you got to do. Haven't done, haven't done, haven't done, so I can't come, I can't come, I can't come. They had the name. No matter what that son did, he had the name. He had that name. And as soon as he saw him coming, he said, kill the fatted calf, do this, do this. He, he welcomed him with more than open arms. As a matter of fact, there was great rejoicing. The Bible says that there's there more than, for when one sheep is found, there's more rejoicing than, than the 99 that are there. He said, so too is it in heaven. When one is found, one's salvation is found, there's more rejoicing over that one than the 99 that are saved. This is, this is the Lord. So you see that open arms and the celebration. But yet you see the other side, the, this other son, he had no idea how to partake of the blessing. He didn't know who he was. He thought who he was was what he did. That's not who you are. You, we, we, we have to get past this, this, this idea that God's looking at us in, based on what we do. Instead of what Jesus has done. Amen. Amen. Hebrews 4, we went, we went to that a few times, but how many of you have ever read this parable? In Matthew 9, 17, it says this. It talks about new wine and old wineskins. New wine and old wineskins. And it says that you can't put new wine in old wineskins. In other words, you can't mix the new and the old. It'll break. And I'll tell you what, there's Christians' lives that are shattered and the promises of God have no effect in their life. That story is you can't put new wineskins or new wine in old wineskins. Why? Because when wine gets put in a, a skin, it ferments and it will cause expansion. And so that old wineskin is now hardened. And if you put new wine, it'll cause it to burst. But he says if you're going to put new wine in, you've got to put it in a new skin, a new house. And this is why you've been born again. And old has passed away. The old and all has become new. So he can put the new in there so that you can partake of the new, the good, the promise. Instead of having Christians' lives shattered because the promise is like just on the ground. Why? Because I'm trying to get the promise, and for some reason, I haven't kicked out of the house Hagar and her son. I haven't kicked out of the house, yeah, but 
you don't know what I did. And, and, and yeah, but I really just feel like this. And yeah, but I just really, I just really, I just really, I want you to listen to this ver- verse. 1 John 3, and then we're going to receive communion. 320. Even if we feel guilty, God is greater than our feelings, and He knows everything. Wait a minute, wait a minute. It says that? Yeah, he says, hey, even if you feel guilty, God's greater than your feelings, and he knows everything. And it goes on to say in verse 24, it says this, and I'm going to read this. It says, those who obey his commands remain in fellowship with him, and he with them. I'm going to read this backwards. Those who have fellowship with him walk in what he says. It's about the fellowship. This is why he sent his son Jesus. Because he not only wants you to have eternity with him, but he wants you to have it here and now because he's a good father. That's Jesus. That's the Lord. Once for all, he gave his son. Once for all. If we can pass out communion, we're going to receive this this morning. You know, you may have heard um, you may have heard people talk about when you receive they receive communion examine yourself you know don't drink of the Lord's cup unworthily lest you be damned I want to talk about that for a moment as you're getting uh, the communion and the glasses passed out the Bible does tell us to examine to examine ourself. What does that mean, to examine yourself? What is it talking about there? Examine yourself, and this is how. Where are you putting your trust? Where are you putting your faith today? Is your trust in what you have done and how good you've been, you're drinking unworthily? Or is your trust in Jesus and what he's done And because of what he's done, he was the one that fulfilled the law and so brought about the promise, which is everything here. And so when we receive communion, and the Bible says it tells us that the the cup or the the, the wine is represented as, as the blood of Jesus which washes us and cleanses us of all unrighteousness and 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 purges our conscience to be clean and just wow. And yet his body that was broken. These are promises we receive broken for what? For me. Stripes on his body for my healing. When I receive this according to what he's done, man, this ought, there ought to be more healings take place just receiving the covenant than any other thing because it's by faith. Yeah, well, if they just lay hands on me. No, it's by faith. Yeah, the Bible says lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Why? Because faith, the prayer of faith will heal the sick. Why did you come? Because you believe. But right here, because you are heir according to the promise, the covenant has been cut. And it's up to us simply to receive that. Can I have one? Thanks. Sometimes it'd be good for you to just receive it at your own house. You know, when things are going crazy. You know, just everything just seems to be going crazy. You know, the Bible says that he makes all grace abound towards us. You know, that's having a sufficiency in all things to to give unto every good work. Maybe you have no money to even give unto any good work. And the Bible says that he gives seed to the sower and bread to the eater. And I'm a sower. And you know know the promises because you put them in you. And you say, no, it, my life does not look like that. Let me remind, be reminded real quick of a covenant that was, w- w- was cut, not by me, but by the Lord and His Son Jesus. And He was broken, His body was broken, and He was crucified so that, so that this, this is what I can have. This is what you said I can have. This is what's mine. This is what's mine. Peace. Maybe your wife struggled, you know, like maybe your wife had, you know, have you ever, you've ever battled depression or something like that? It's a real deal. Chastisement of peace. 
was upon him. So my, my family, I don't, I'm telling you, we're going to have to get a little bit. This is what you said, Lord. Why? Because you and I, this is why we're sharing this. If we don't understand the message of Jesus, we can never convey it. When we go out to Halloween takeover, why? When we're, when we're a church that's beat up and trying to live up. Instead of to live out. Live out of the love of God that's been shed abroad. Live out. Amen. The Bible says on the same night when Jesus was betrayed, he took a cup and he said that, that it was representative of the New Testament or the new covenant that was cut. A new covenant that was based on better promises. And he took the cup and he said, when you drink this, remember that it was my body and my blood that purchased your freedom. Drink it. Thank you, Lord. Lord, just right now, with heads bowed, eyes closed, we just tell you that our faith, our trust, our hope, it's in you. Lord, I thank you for a redirecting of hearts. A redirecting of hearts. To put our trust in you. And Lord, I, I didn't even read from the scripture. I might have took the bread and the cup backwards from what is written. I think I did. But I thank you that your body was broken. I thank you this is a perfect picture of what my faith lies in. It's not even the formula of how I receive communion. But it's trust and total reliance on you. And I thank you that your body was broken. And you broke your body. Your body was broken for me. And that by your stripes, Lord, I'm healed and I receive your body in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we trust you today. If you're here today and you've You've never made Jesus the Lord and Savior of your life. If you receive communion, you just told him that you trust his blood and you trust that his body was broken. And you made him your Lord and your Savior. But if you're here this morning, you say, man, I just want to pray some kind of prayer just to tell the Lord I love him. Well, I'll pray a prayer, but I want you to, t- I want you to know this. I don't want anybody praying it after me. I want you to pray a prayer from your own heart. You can kind of pattern it after this one I'm going to pray, but learn to just come to the Lord. When you say, I want to come, I want to come, I want to come, let me just say this, come. Come at home. Come in the car. Come on your way to church. Come anywhere you are. So Father, I just come to you right now. Not based on my performance, because I know it hasn't been the best. But I come to you because you said I could and that you desire me to. That you desire me to. So I come to you right now, Lord. I come boldly to your throne. And I thank you for your mercy that it's easy to find. Matter of fact, it's overflowing in your presence. And I thank you for your grace. Thank you for Jesus. Today, I walk out these doors knowing that I can always come. And right now I tell you that I will always come because I know you have good for me in store. And I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. It's uh, 1210, I think you're pretty good on time, but if you need healing in your body and you haven't, you know, right there, you're just like, oh, I, just, I felt like when I came here, I knew I needed to come up after service. Man, come up. We'd love to agree with you in prayer. But I believe the blood of Jesus, it's not something you're going to be healed. Listen to me. Don't, don't say I'm going to be healed. You were healed. You are healed. 
When you receive, when you receive Jesus, that is when your healing was manifest in your body. Amen. Hey, love you guys. Don't forget about Starting Point next door. Otherwise, enjoy this like fall weather. Was it not like fall when you woke up this morning? Walked outside. Praise the Lord. Hunting season is almost here. God bless you guys. We'll see you next week.